Welcome to the Divine Hangout. I'm your host, Hilary Jubilee. It is my intention that when you listen to this podcast, you experience an increase in peace, abundance, and divine miracles in your life experience. If you love all things spirituality, wellness, healing, manifestation, and miracles, you are in the exact right place at the exact right time. Let's enter the portal together. Well, hello there. It is Hilary Jubilee, and this is the first episode of The Divine Hangout. Today's episode is going to be the introduction to A Course in Miracles. And this is going to just, if you've never heard of A Course in Miracles, then um, I'm going to explain to you what that is. Um, This podcast is going to be about a variety of subjects, but I am going to have A Course in Miracles be a large part of that. So basically, I'm still figuring out the setup. So if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see that I am just the table that I'm using is kind of rickety, so if I move it and you hear something, we'll figure out the kinks later. We're just jumping into it, okay? Uh, so the way that I'm going to introduce A Course in Miracles is I'm actually just going to read the preface to you uh, because the preface explains how it came, what it says, and what it is. Not in that order. <laughs> uh, but it basically, it's a spiritual text. Uh, that was written in the 70s, I believe, by Helen Shuckman and William Thetford. Uh, And they wrote the book by channeling. So I'm going to read the preface here. And uh, if it's too much, it might might just be some excerpts. But uh, let's go ahead and read the preface here. Okay, so it says, This preface was written in 1977 in response to many requests for a brief introduction to A Course in Miracles. The first two parts, how it came, what it is, Helen Shuckman wrote herself. The final part, what it says, was written by the process of interdictation as described in the preface. How it came. A Course in Miracles began with the sudden decision of two people to join in a common goal. Their names were Helen Shuckman and William Thetford, professors of medical psychology at Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons in New York City. It does not matter who they were, except that the story shows that with God, all things are possible. They were anything but spiritual. Their relationship with each other was difficult and often strained, and they were concerned with personal and professional acceptance and status. In general, they had considerable investment in the values of the world. Their lives were hardly in accord with anything that the Course advocates. Helen, the one who received the material, describes herself. Psychologist, educator, conservative in theory, and atheist Atheistic in belief, I was working in a prestigious and highly academic setting. And then something happened that triggered a chain of events I could have never predicted. The head of my department unexpectedly announced that he was tired of the angry and aggressive feelings our attitudes reflected and concluded that there must be another way. As if on cue, I agreed to help him find it. Apparently, this course is the other way. Although their intention was serious, they had great difficulty in starting out on their joint venture but they had given the Holy Spirit the little willingness that, as the Course itself was to emphasize again and again, is sufficient to enable him to use any situation for his purposes and provide it with his power. To continue Helen's first-person account, three startling months preceded the actual writing, during which time Bill suggested that I write down the highly symbolic dreams and descriptions of the strange images that were coming to me. Although I had grown more accustomed to the unexpected by that time, I was still very surprised when I wrote, this is a course in miracles. That was my introduction to the voice. It made no sound, but seemed to be giving me a kind of rapid interdictation, which I took down in a shorthand book, shorthand notebook. The writing was never automatic. It could be interrupted at any time and later picked up again. It made me very uncomfortable, but it never seriously occurred to me to stop. It seemed to be a special assignment that I had somehow, somewhere agreed to complete. It represented a truly collaborative venture between Bill and myself, and much of its significance, I'm sure, lies in that. I would take down what the voice said and read it to him the the next day. 
and he typed it from my dictation. I expect he had his special assignment too. Without his encouragement and support, I would never have been able to fulfill mine. The whole process took about seven years. The text came first, then the workbook for students, and finally the manual for teachers. Only a few minor changes have been made. Chapter titles and subheadings have, now, have been inserted in the text and some of the more personal references that occurred at the beginning have been omitted. Otherwise, the material is substanti substantially unchanged. The names of the collaborators in the recording of the course do not appear on the cover because the course can and should stand on its own. It is not intended to become the basis for another cult. Its only purpose is to provide a way in which some people will be able to find their own internal teacher. What it is. As its title implies, the course is arranged throughout as a teaching device. It consists of three books, a 669 page text, a 488 page workbook for students, and a 92 page manual for teachers. The order in which the students choose to use the books and the ways in which they study them depend on their particular needs and preferences. The curriculum the course proposes is carefully conceived and is explained step by step at both theoretical and practical levels. My fur child. It emphasizes application rather than theory and experience rather than theology. It, is, it specifically states that a universal theology is impossible, but a universal experience is not only possible, but necessary. Although Christian in statement, the course deals with universal spiritual themes. It emphasizes that it is but one version of the universal curriculum. There are many others, this one differing from them only in form. They all lead to God in the end. The text is largely theoretical and sets forth the concepts on which the course's thought system is based. Its ideas contain the foundation for the workbook's lessons. Without the practical application of the workbook provides, the text would remain largely a series of abstractions, which would hardly suffice to bring about the thought reversal at which the course aims. The workbook includes 365 lessons, one for each day of the year. It is not necessary, however, to do the lessons at that tempo, and one might want to remain with a particularly appealing lesson for more than one day. The instructions urge only that not more than one lesson a day should be attempted. attempted. The practical nature of the workbook is underscored by the introduction to its lessons, which emphasizes experience through, through application rather than a prior commitment to a spiritual goal. Some of the ideas the workbook presents you will find you will find hard to believe, and others may seem to be quite startling. This does not matter. You are merely asked to apply the ideas as you are directed to do. You are not asked to judge them at all. You are only you are asked only to use them. It is their use that will give them meaning to you and will show you that they are true. Remember only this. You do not need to believe the ideas. You need not accept them and you need not even welcome them. Some of them you may actively resist. None of this will matter or decrease their efficacy, but do not allow yourself to make exceptions in applying the ideas the workbook contains and whatever your reactions to the ideas may be, use them. Nothing more than that is required. Finally, the manual for teachers, which is written in <sighs> There's animals barking and purring and walking and living <laughs> all around here. Finally, the manual Finally, the manual for teachers, which is written in question and answer form, provides answers to some of the more likely questions a student might ask. It also includes a clarification of a number of the terms the course uses, explaining them within the theoretical framework of the text. The course makes no claim to finality, nor are the workbook lessons intended to bring the student's learning to completion. At the end, the reader is left in the hands of his or her own internal teacher.
Right. At the end, the reader is left in the hands of his or her own internal teacher, who will direct all subsequent learning as he sees fit. While the course is comprehensive in scope, the truth cannot be limited to any finite form. As is clearly recognized in the statement at the end of the workbook. This course is a beginning, not an end. No more specific lessons are assigned, for there's no more need of them. Henceforth, hear but the voice for God. He will direct your efforts, telling you exactly what to do, how to direct your mind, and when to come to him in silence. Asking for his sure direction and his certain word. What it says. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. This is how A Course in Miracles begins. It makes a fundamental distinction between the real and the unreal, between knowledge and perception. Knowledge is truth under one law, the law of love or God. Truth is unalterable, eternal, and, unambag and unambiguous. It can be recognized, but it cannot be changed. It applies to everything that God created, and only what he created is real. It is beyond learning because it is beyond time and process. It has no opposite, no beginning, and no end. It merely is. The world of perception, on the other hand, is the world of time, of change, of beginnings and endings. It is based on interpretation, not on facts. It is the world of birth and death, founded on a belief in scarcity, loss, separation, and death. It is learned rather than given, selective in its perpetual emphasis, emphases, unstable in its functioning, and inaccurate in, in its interpretations. From knowledge and perception, respectively, two distinct thought systems arise, which are opposite in every respect. In the realm of knowledge, no thoughts exist apart from God, because God and his creation share one will. The world of perception, however, is made by the belief in opposites and separate wills in perpetual conflict with each other and with God. What perception sees and hears appears to be real because it permits into awareness only what conforms to the wishes of the perceiver. This leads to a world of illusions, a world which needs constant defense precisely because it is not real. Stop, oh my God, Feline. <laughs> I can't with you guys. Tweedledee and Tweedledum over here. Whew. When you have been caught in the world of perception, you are caught in a dream. You cannot escape without help because everything your senses show merely witnesses to the reality of the dream. God has provided the answer, the only way out, the true helper. It is the function of his voice, his Holy Spirit, to mediate between the two worlds. He can do this because while on one hand he knows the truth, on the other he also recognizes our illusions, but without believing in them. It is the Holy Spirit's goal to help us escape from the dream world by teaching us how to reverse our thinking and unlearn our mistakes. For forgiveness is the Holy Spirit's great learning aid in bringing this thought reversal about. However, the Course has its own definition of what forgiveness really is, just as it defines the world in its own way. The world we see merely reflects our own internal frame of reference, the dominant ideas, wishes, and emotions in our minds. Projection makes perception. We look inside first, decide the kind of world we want to see, and then project that world outside, making it the truth as we see it. We make it true by our interpretations of what it is we are seeing. If we are using perception to justify our own mistakes, our anger, our impulses to attack, our lack of love in whatever form it may take, we will see a world of evil, destruction, malice, envy, and despair. All this we must learn to forgive, not because we are being good and charitable, but because what we are seeing is not true. We have distorted the world by our, defen by our twisted defenses and, un and are therefore seeing what is not there. As we learn to recognize our, perpetual, our perceptual errors, we also learn to look past them or forgive. At the same time, we are forgiving ourselves, 
looking past our distorted self-concepts to the self that God created in us and as us. Sin is defined as lack of love. Since love is all there is, sin in the sight of the Holy Spirit is a mistake to be corrected rather than an evil to be punished. Our sense of ina inadequacy, weakness, and incompletion comes from the strong investment in the scarcity principle that governs the whole world of illusions. From that point of view, we seek in others what we feel is wanting in ourselves. We love another in order to get something ourselves. That, in fact, is what passes for love in the dream world. There can be no greater mistake than that, for love is incapable of asking for anything. Only minds can really join, and whom God has joined, no man can put asunder. It is, however, only at the level of Christ's mind that true union is possible and has, in fact, never been lost. The little I seeks to enhance itself by external approval, external possessions, and external love. The self that God created needs nothing. It is forever complete, safe, loved, and loving. It seeks to share rather than to get, to extend rather than project. It has no needs and wants to join in, to join with others out of their mutual awareness, awareness of abundance. It has no needs and wants to join with others out of their mutual awareness of abundance. The special relationships of the world are destructive, selfish, and childishly egocentric. Yet, if given to the Holy Spirit, these relationships that can become the holiest things on earth. The miracles that point the way to the return to heaven. The world uses its special relationships as a final weapon of exclusion and a demonstration of separateness. The Holy Spirit transforms them into perfect lessons in forgiveness and in awakening from the dream. Each one is an opportunity to let perceptions be healed and errors corrected. Each one is another chance to forgive oneself by forgiving the other. And each one becomes still another invitation to the Holy Spirit and to the remembrance of God. Perception is a function of the body and therefore represents a limit on awareness. Perception sees through the body's eyes and hears through the body's ears. It evokes the limited responses which the body makes. The body appears to be largely self-motivated and independent, yet it actually responds only to the intentions of the mind. If the mind wants to use it for attack in any form, it becomes prey to sickness, age, and decay. If the mind accepts the Holy Spirit's purpose for it instead, it becomes a useful way of communicating with others, invulnerable as long as it is needed, and to be gently laid by when its use is over. Of itself, it is neutral, as is everything in the world of perception. Whether it is used for the goals of the ego or the Holy Spirit depends entirely on what the mind wants. The opposite of seeing through the body's eyes is the vision of Christ, which reflects strength rather than weakness unity rather than separation, and love rather than fear. The opposite of hearing through the body's ears is communication through the voice of God, the Holy Spirit, which abides in each of us. His voice seems distant and difficult to hear because the ego, which speaks for the little separated self, seems to be much louder. This is actually reversed. The Holy Spirit speaks with an unmistakable clarity and overwhelming appeal. No one who does not choose to identify with the body could possibly be deaf to his messages of release and hope, nor could he fail to accept joyously the vision of Christ in glad exchange for his miserable picture of himself. Christ's vision is the Holy Spirit's gift, God's alternative to the illusion of separation and to the belief in the reality of sin, guilt, and death. It is the one correction for all errors of perception the reconciliation of the seeming opposites on which this world is based. Its kindly light shows all things from another point of view, reflecting the thought system that arises from the knowledge from knowledge and making return to God not only possible, but inevitable. What was regarded as injustices done to one by someone else now becomes a call for help and for union. Sin, sickness, and attack are seen as misperceptions calling for remedy through gentleness and love. Defenses are laid down because where there is no attack, there is no need for them. Our brother's needs become our own because they are taking the journey with us as we go to God. Without us, they would lose their way. Without them, we, would, we could never find our own. Forgiveness is unknown in heaven where the need for it would be inconceivable. 
However, in this world, forgiveness is necessary correction for all the mistakes that we have made. To offer forgiveness is the only way for us to have it. For it reflects the law of heaven that giving and receiving are the same. Heaven is the natural state of all the sons of God as he created them. Such is their reality forever. It is not changed because it has been forgotten. Forgiveness is the means by which we will remember. Through forgiveness, the thinking of the world is reversed. The forgiven world becomes the gate of heaven because by its mercy, we can at last forgive ourselves. Holding no one prisoner to guilt, we become free. Acknowledging Christ in all our brothers, we recognize his presence in ourselves. Forgetting all our misperceptions and with nothing from the past to hold us back, we can remember God. Beyond this, learning cannot go. When we are ready, God himself will take the final step in our return to him. Okay, so that was the preface. I want to, a couple of things are coming up as I'm reading that. One of them is that obviously the Course in Miracles uses Christian language. And if you had been following my YouTube channel before I started this, started this podcast, I talk a lot about, I talked a lot about Neville Goddard and his work. And Neville Goddard talks about the law of assumption and he uses Christian terms in a spiritual way. So kind of in a non-Christian way, it's not religious the way he's using the terms. Uh, that's how I interpret it anyway. It's, it's, it's like spirituality without the dogma, right? So if try not to let the words bother you, like, if you have some sort of like sometimes these words can be loaded for me they were before i found neville goddard uh, the word god used to bother me like if i came across this book at the wrong time i would not have been studying it but it, if you feel called to it then you're probably that's probably why you're clicking on this episode but if the words bother you just you can replace christ and god with universe oneness love like it doesn't need to necessarily uh be those those um, terms if, if they do bother you but it does use those terms all throughout the book so just wanted to kind of touch on that and then as well uh, the entire Course in Miracles if you're interested in it is free online you can get the entire text the entire uh, workbook also 365 lessons and the um, the manual for teachers is there too so it, if you do the daily lessons what I'm going to do with this podcast is uh, I'm going to have some interviews. I'm going to uh, talk about all sorts of spirituality, but I'm also going to do an episode for every lesson. So that's 365 lessons, uh, 365 episodes. So I'm going to um, embark on that. Uh, but basically the course, it is the path to peace. When I study the course, I feel inner peace. And I, and it's so funny because when I came across the course, a lot of the principles kind of go against typical manifestation and things like that, because you're trying to get something. But the irony is when you focus on peace and um, gaining that sense of inner calm and not needing anything is when your desires flow in to you. Because when you come from a place of wholeness, and abundance, that is the type of things that you're going to attract to you or manifest to you. So it's, it's all a paradox. There's so many paradoxes, but, um, yeah, when I first came across it, I was like, these are contradictory. Like, how can I talk about manifestation and talk about a course in miracles? Like they're, they're clashing, uh, but that's okay. <laughs> they're not really clashing. Uh, I mean, they are, and they're not, so it's a paradox, but anyway, the level of peace that I feel when I study this. So, and again, I'm going to be, you know, talking about it and kind of teaching from it, but at the same time, uh, you're always a student of it. Uh, Marianne Williamson talks about A Course in Miracles a lot, and she, the way she describes it is she's a student of A Course in Miracles. So kind of like no matter how many years you've been studying it, you're always going to be a student, uh, unless you're like an ascended master, which... I'm not so I'm a student of the Course in Miracles but A Course in Miracles also talks about like as you teach you learn so learning and teaching are kind of one and yeah so if you're into that then this podcast is for you 
And if you're not, uh, the podcast is not only going to be A Course in Miracles. I'm also going to, like I said, I have a list of people that I already am so excited to interview. And yeah, I think I will leave it there because this episode is going to be kind of long with me reading that entire preface. Um, but I thank you so much for being here and would love if you would um, give me a five-star review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you're listening. And if you're on YouTube, if you could give me a thumbs up and if you could subscribe, I would love that. And thank you for being here. I love you. Goodbye. Thank you.